Thanks very much for your time. Pleasure. Uh, in 1991, at the inaugural Conference of Major Superannuation Funds, you talked about the need to keep super simple. This year, the current government's simple super policy becomes law. Has Mr Costello really simplified super? Well, you've got to look at, I think, the reasons why the government has done this. And there's, there's one, one reason, one reason only. As you know, they spent a decade ignoring superannuation. They did. It's the elephant under the carpet that they tried to ignore. And of course, as it neared a trillion in savings, they couldn't ignore it anymore. It was like a gold box left on the pavement. The Labor Party didn't do anything with it. And even though the Coalition would have liked to have picked it up, it was associated with me, and anything associated with me they don't like. And they were waiting for Labor to claim it, which it didn't. So finally, temptation got the better of them, and they reached out and got it or tried to. Now, what they've, what the genesis of the current change is, is that when they legislated for choice and people moved superannuation accounts around, the tax office was practically unable to enforce the 1983 quarantine. The grandfathering pre and post 83, mm -hmm. they couldn't track them anymore. So, in a sense, they had to be rid of it. Well, in other yeah, words, yeah. it was a, what drove the change was not some bright idea in the Treasurer's head. What drove the change was the tax office telling the government, hey, listen, with your portability, we can't track the pre and post 83 anymore. So they had to be rid of it. But you see, why was the pre and post 83 there in the first place? I put it in. Why? Not to make it complicated, just that before 83, virtually superannuation was untaxed. But it only went to people in the public sector and a few at the top end of industry. To have it for the whole workforce, you had to appropriately tax it. And that came in in 83, so you had to have a pre and a post. Mm -hmm. Now, if you've got money running out of your ears, out of the, as the government currently does out of the terms of trade boom, you can afford to remove that concession now. And the other thing is, you see, anyone who was 45 in 1983 is is now retired. Yep. So most of the grandfathering has lapsed. It's gone. So they saw the opportunity of saying, let's make a virtue out of necessity. Let's call this simplification and we'll remove all the tax at the back. Now, that's fine with me. At some point, if I'd have been there, I would have, in the end, made some gesture to remove the pre and post-83 changes mm -hmm. because they're just an administrative nightmare as they always were, particularly if you've got to track them. But given that most, a lot of people who were born in the 1940s are now retiring, the pre-83s have sort of just faded out, you know. So it was, and as you know, uh, there was, for people up to, I forget the number, I think 115,000, 150,000 of accumulation, there was no tax anyway. I had on the back, the payout, a reasonable benefits limit. When the government decided to remove the tax altogether on people over 60, they've also decided to remove the reasonable benefit limit. But they've moved it from the back to the front. Mm. So now the limit's 150000 a year. You follow me? Yeah. After the first million. And it's like, you know, this is the Liberal Party. Of course, what they've done, they've done a top-end change for people they think vote for them. So in other words, if you've got a million to spare... And the guy running behind the garbage truck hasn't got a million to spare. But if you've got a million to spare, you can get it in before 30 June. I mean, why you'd have a nine-month policy with a cut-off is beyond me. Mm. But after that, you go back to 150000 a year. So in other words, having done nothing about superannuation for a decade, the first real thing they do is give a tax break to the people at the top end of the system. But the interesting thing about the way it's been sold is that everyone thinks that they've got a benefit from it. There is there is a perception that this is good well, for everybody. Well this is, a, well, this is a government that, you know, always going for Olympic gold in fibbing, you know. The fact is, up to 150000 there was no tax. So there is no benefit for those people mm. in this, right? Where the benefit is is for the big end of town who can put a million in uh, and, uh, you know, you can have a million plus... 
four years of, I think it's 150, which is yeah. uh, 600, you'll end up with about 1.7 million in there under those arrangements, which you wouldn't have had under the RBLs. But again, the RBLs were designed to make the whole superannuation system affordable for the whole workforce. Rather than yeah. a rather than just the cream, the blokes and the, and the gals mm. at the top, you know, mm. they were getting the big incomes, you know, but that's them, isn't it? That's yeah. that's the libs. But let's look, let's look back also at that, at that opening remarks that you made at the inaugural conference in Wollongong in '91. You also stressed the need for adequacy for all Australian workers, and in that, yeah. in that, you you uh, you you forecast that we would go to 15 percent rather than the nine. Yeah. Now, you must have had certain disappointments that surrounded the fact that super has not achieved that, and both governments, or both government and the Labor Party in this case, yeah. have said they won't be touching that. No, well, the fact is, I wasn't forecasting it. I actually legislated. I was legislating for it. I announced in the 1995 budget, or Ralph Willis announced as Treasurer, that, that we would pay the next round of tax cuts to the equivalent of 3% of wages into everyone's superannuation account. In other words, we would pay them as savings, not as cash. You know, that was announced. Ralph announced that. And we budgeted for that in the out year. And under Accord Mark 8, with Bill Kelty and the ACTU, we had agreed on the next wage round, workers would put away 3% as a co-payment to match it. It was called the co-payment. Yeah. So it was three plus three, with six on top of nine became 15. You might remember, in the 96 election, there was a, 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 a brouhaha about the LA law tax cuts, the second round of the LA law mm -hmm. tax cuts. I said I'd pay them as super. Howard and Costello said in 96 uh, that people would, if they weren't paid exactly the way I was paying, they would lose none of their value. Of course, they lied and broke their promise. They're the ones who broke the second round of the LA law tax cut promise. So when they said, no, we're not paying the 3%, well, of course, the 3% co-payment fell down. So we didn't lose three, we lost six. Mm. So we're still at nine, and nine's not enough. Well, that raises the question, I suppose, uh, in talking to um, both uh, Mr Dutton and Mr Sherry, they both suggest that Mr. Who? Uh, Mr. Dutton, the, the government spokesman for um, the oh, government right, minister yeah. for super, right. and Sherry, the opposition yeah. spokesperson, yeah. both of them have said that they will not be revisiting the 15%. On Sherry's part, he said it was $6 billion that they couldn't afford. Yeah, well, they're dead ordinary, these guys. I mean, it, well, I said it recently, it's a failure of imagination. You know, do you think the 9%, a trillion got put there because of affordability? You know, and when they say affordable, just remember what they're saying. This is a government that spends all of the surplus all of the time. It just keeps the surplus running on empty. It has a little tiny bit of surplus after it's had these massive revenues from, you know, 15 years of growth and a big terms of trade pickup. Where are national savings best left? On a cabinet table to be plundered by a group of greedy spending ministers or a prime minister that has no sense of fiscal responsibility? Or are they best left in individual Australian super account, preserved, and I emphasise preserved, to age 60? Mm. Of course, in national savings terms, qualitatively, there's no comparison. It's not a matter of affordable. Of course, there's no question of affordability. It's a matter of where the savings are best in a... Would you leave the savings in some, some rinky-dink future fund or, or be spent on rural roads for the National Party? Or would you see it in people's super accounts? And why should why should the Commonwealth have financial assets anyway? I mean, it shouldn't be technically running huge surpluses like this. It should pay them back in tax cuts, but pay them back as savings, not as cash. So mm. this is why the whole question of affordability is just just really a, a, a non sequitur, you know. Well, interestingly, um, last Friday Wayne Swan spoke at an AS for lunch, and he was reported in the. Um, in the Daily Press on, it was Thursday, reported in the Daily Press on Friday that he was going to reintroduce Labor support for a 15% contribution, but he was going to provide it through expansion of the co-contribution scheme. Mm. Sherry went on record as saying the issue was still dead, largely due to the estimated $6 billion price tag. 
Now, and Peter Dutton then also said that Simple Super addressed a lot of the adequacy questions and his government is comfortable with the 9%. Yeah. But is 15% in 2007 adequate? I mean, 15 is adequate, yes. Is the it problem, still adequate the, today? 15 would be if we were getting, getting there, sure. The real problem is a great part of the Australian war, workforce was born in the 1940s. So when I first introduced the first 1%, they were, they were already 40 years of age. Right? And now yeah. they're 60. They haven't, there wasn't enough time for them to accumulate this. So the baby boomers never got enough time. That's why you had to front end load it to 15, not 9. And that's why, I mean, if you join the workforce at 22 and retire at 60, 15 is fine. Hmm. But if you're in the workforce and you turn 40 and you turn 40 in 1985 or 6 it's not fine yeah you know and that's why you see you don't expect Dutton to be out there barracking for ordinary working men and women women in retail guys running behind garbage trucks builders laborers they won't barrack for them 9% will never get them enough if you have 9% of the fund and you came into it at 30 or 40 and the fund earns 6.5% a year you don't you'll always still need the age pension to take this view about affordability the kind of view sherry puts it's a sort of an accountancy approach oh well the budget we've got ons and offs outlays and receipts and we're going to have this much but that's not the point the budget's in structural surplus that is revenue to gdp is higher than outlays to gdp so therefore there's a massive structural surplus there. Hmm. That is best paid back as tax cuts, not put in a super fund, in a future fund. It's best paid back as tax cuts, but as savings, not as cash. Hmm. That's the point. I mean, it doesn't take a lot of grey matter to work this out. But the governments around the world are, are find favour in giving people money back rather than giving them savings. And look what happened here. The last big round of tax cuts here, a year or so ago, Governor Ian McFarlane warned the government about stimulating demand and the government, you know, being, being the political types they are, made the tax cuts and what happened? He put the rates up by half a percentage point to claw it back. Hmm. You know. So in other words, what happened was that people who owned money got the benefit and those who owned debt didn't. Uh, whereas if they'd have gone into super accounts, they couldn't be touched to age 60. I mean, you can't compare the quality of preservation to age 60 for national savings with anything in the budget. Hmm. You know, or, or the guys playing around with the future fund. Yeah. Well, the future fund, I suppose, is another issue altogether. It's, a, it's, it's grown exponentially. I mean, there's over 50, 50 uh, billion in there now. It's a lot of money. Well, you, you, you give, that, give that back to working people, and that's where it should be. Otherwise, it says nominally they're there, it's there to deal with, they said, they had, they had to find a reason. See, they, you've got to remember this about the Liberal Party. It's always hated superannuation. They only loved it when it was for the top end of industry and the public service. Once I made it for the broad workforce with the ACTU, they hated it. They don't want workers managing money. You know, they hate the trustee structure, they hate the industry funds. That's why they left it for a decade. Mm. And this is why, you know, the idea that that we've got to top up the 9%, which we have to, of course, uh, is, a, is an anathema to them. And while they, frankly, they say, look, let's put it into a fund as long as they don't get their hands on it. That fund is still, strictly speaking, only for uh, the responsibilities in, they have for Commonwealth employees. Commonwealth employees, which are otherwise, for 100 years, dealt with out of each year's mm. budget. So why do we need it? Why do we need the super fund? I mean, you've got good people, people like David Murray, very good people, running a fund that doesn't need to exist. Hmm. Well, I mean, I suppose it begs the question. Earlier this month, you, you, you gave some, um, some quite outspoken advice to both Howard and the Treasurer. Given that for years the Labour Party had the mantle of the, of, of the, of the party of super, what advice would you give Sherry and now um, Swan, who's come into the, into the argument, yeah. um, for, for, for regaining that title? Well... I, I, very, I was encouraged by Swan's remarks. Swan is the first person to mention 15% in the Federal Labor Party in 11 years. Yeah? Mm -hmm. As amazing as that is, you know. You know, if I was, if I was Kevin, I'd drum Sherry out of the regiment, frankly. He'd brought not two cents worth of value to working people in super, in my opinion. Uh, and you've got to pay on results, you know. Uh, 
if the Labor Party doesn't look after the interest of ordinary working men and women, who will?